Good afternoon, and thank you very much for joining GGA and Mail and Guardians uh, webinar that focuses on Zambia. And we'll be focusing on the first 100 days of Zambia's President Hakainde Hichilema's presidency. Well, uh, just a quick introduction. Uh, Good Governance Africa is an applied policy research think tank that is based here in Rosebank, South Africa. And we are interested in focusing on all issues related to governance across Southern Africa and indeed across the African continent. As such, we have a very simple understanding of uh, what governance means. In our understanding, governance really refers to who gets what, when and how. It is about the authoritative allocation of resources. And this is particularly important for this webinar, where we'll be focusing on the first 100 days of Zambia's Hakiende Hichilema's presidency. Well, as you can imagine, assuming the role of president is a daunting uh, task, even for the most accomplished of individuals who attain uh, such high office, taking responsibility for an entire country, especially one beset by many internal challenges like that, uh, like we see in Zambia. As the UPND's President uh, Hakiede Hichilema's leadership crosses that 100-day mark probably in a few days' time next week, it's important for us as Good Governance Africa to host this webinar where we'll focus on discussions, uh, focusing on his performance in those 100 days in office. We believe it's essential to continue engaging and assessing the new administration's progress in mapping out its political economic trajectory. So is the new Zambian president showing signs of making good on his campaign pr uh, promises? Will he be able to navigate the country's challenges, uh, the economic crisis, citizen empowerment, crackdowns, targeted violence, reforms towards competent leadership of institutions and the challenges of, of course, COVID-19 are some of the new administration's policy challenges which they'll have to uh, deal with. The list, as you can imagine, is not exhaust exhaustive as there is need to facilitate much broader reforms across uh, different sectors. So in this webinar, we look back on President Hichilema's first 100 days as president of Zambia and discuss the country's prospects and challenges on the road to what we anticipate will be positive reforms under this new president. I imagine it's essential to assess the progress towards addressing some of the core challenges by leaders and holding them to account for the delivery of some of these electoral promises that were made. Well, I won't be alone in trying to assess some of these uh, important uh, questions related to the progress that has been made by President uh, Hichilema. I'll be joined by a very distinguished panel of interlocutors. We'll be joined by Ms. Laura Mitty, who is Executive Director of uh, the Alliance for Community Action. We'll also have with us Dr. Grieve Keloa, who is Director of Research at the Institute uh, on Race, Power and Political Economy at the New School. And finally, we'll also have Mr. Boniface Chimbe, who is Executive Director uh, for, Southern, for the Southern African Center for uh, Constructive Resolution of uh, Disputes. So over the last few months, GGA, uh, just to give you context, has been running a campaign that seeks to understand uh, the many key issues at stake um, relating to Zambia. This involves coverage on key on the key uh, pre-election period, the challenges that were faced, analysis of the voting day developments, and now uh, the multifaceted solutions that are required to meet the governance challenges by the new administration. So without further ado, I'm going to invite uh, for about 10 minutes for our in invited uh, interlocutors to give us a sense of how uh, they have seen the first 100 days of administration. And I'm going to invite 
uh, initially, Dr. Chelo, to give us his initial observations. Dr. Chelo, please go ahead, sir. Um, thank you, Mr. Maroleng. I know you told us before that we started to call you Chris, so I thought I'd start by calling you formally, and then I'll revert to Chris. Uh, I hope you can hear me, and I'm clear. Loud and clear. Thank you very much. Okay. So uh, thanks for inviting me to give these remarks. I want, I want to thank Good Governance Africa and you, Chris Maroleng, and Mel and Guardian for organizing this event. Uh, so I am honored certainly to commemorate 100 days of uh, uh, the HH presidency with two fellow Zambians. A lot. I apologize, uh, Dr. Chilo. We, we seem to have lost your audio. Okay. Yes, uh, we can hear I, I you now. Okay, somebody might have muted me, but uh, yes. so I'll, I'll, I'll start again. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I was just saying thanks again to Good Governance Africa and Melan Guardian for putting this event together. Uh, we are here to take stock of uh, the presidency, of a presidency that many have described as historic. Uh, anyone who has followed Zambia's recent political history or story over the last 10 years or so appreciates the significance of what took place a little over 90 days ago on 12th August 2021. Uh, for many, that day's election was a battle for the very soul of the country. Uh, many people described it as a battle for the very soul of the country. Uh, in scenes that hadn't been witnessed in quite some time, uh, many got up in the early hours of the morning to go and line up and cast their vote. Right. My wife and I hardly slept at night. We left the house at 4 a.m. and drove to our polling station to, ca to cast our votes. Uh, I was overtaken by an immense sense of pride queuing up with my brothers and sisters and fighting for the future of our country. Uh, the sacred meaning of what we were doing that morning wasn't lost on me, uh, which is that power ultimately, ultimately belongs to the people. And that's what was demonstrated on that day. Uh, anyways, it is now almost 100 days to the day that uh, Hakainde Ichilema was sworn in as the seventh president of Zambia. Uh, the celebratory euphoria is many days behind us now, and it is time to conduct a sober and reasonable, reasoned appraisal of his administration's performance. Um, so how has his administration performed is the question we're trying to answer today. Uh, I'll limit my very brief comments on to economic administration and economic policy, uh, given that's the area that I know best. That's the area of my expertise. Uh, so let me start. So on the economic administration side, uh, uh, which is to say uh, sort of on the side where the president, you know, his team, the president's team that helps him in implementing economic policy. Uh, president Hitchlem has appointed uh, uh, some stewards that many consider to have the credentials and credibility to be in charge of economic policy. Uh, at the Ministry of Finance, Mr. Hitchlem has appointed a long-serving public servant, a long-serving uh, technocrat, uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Stumbekom Sokotwane as Minister of Finance. Uh, at the Central Bank, uh, Mr. Hitchlema has appointed uh, Dr. Denny Kalialia as governor. Uh, both appointees have PhDs in economics, and they have quite long careers at the forefront of setting economic policy uh, in the country. Uh, Dr. Kalialia was, uh, I think, previously served as, uh, I think, deputy governor, if I'm not mistaken, was uh, director of the economics department at the Central Bank, and prior to that was at the University of Zambia as an academic, and then subsequently left to go work at the World Bank. So certainly somebody who has a very rich CV, uh, Dr. Msokotwane, the Minister of Finance, has a similar CV, once permanent secretary in the Minister of Finance, previous Minister of Finance in the MMD administration of Mr. Rupia Banda, and then he's now come back as Minister of Finance. So one cannot certainly fought uh, the economic experience uh, or the, the experience in economic policy of these two gentlemen, and they come with the requisite academic qualifications. As you know, the Ministry of Finance and the Central Bank are the two entities through which economic policy is implemented, right? So the Ministry of Finance is responsible for what we call fiscal policy, that is policy on revenue expenditure, as well as in many ways setting long-term economic development plans for the country. Uh, and the Bank of Zambia is responsible for monetary policy. So this is decisions about the setting of interest rates, uh, decisions about, uh, you know, the money supply, also decisions about how uh, the financial sector ought to function. So these are two important appointments. And to my mind, uh, Mr. Hitchland appointed 
two very well qualified gentlemen. One can certainly quibble with their ideas about economic recovery, but certainly one cannot quibble with their uh, qualifications and, uh, and credibility. At, at State House, Mr. Uh, although quite belatedly and only last week, uh, Mr. Hichlem has appointed Dr. Pamela Cavasso as economic advisor. Uh, although there's some confusions about her role versus the role of uh, Mr. Jito Kayumba, who is officially special assistant to the president for economic affairs as well. So, but he's brought in Dr. Cavasso last week, Friday, uh, to serve as economic advisor. Uh, Dr. Cavasso holds a PhD in economics and was for some time the executive director of a very influential uh, economic policy think tank, ZIPA, which is very well regarded uh, in the country. So she certainly comes with very, uh, and certainly taught me at the University of Zambia as well. Uh, another plus is that we have seen an incredible improvement in transparency, especially on the part of the Ministry of Finance in communicating uh, the status quo about the country's debt position. As you know, Chris, uh, one of the things that was really bothersome about the Patriotic Front Administration, the administration that lost the election in August, was just the op opacity about uh, the country's debt situation. I think we saw a lot of interest both domestically and internationally about Zambia's uh, actual date status. But what has happened now is that the Minister of Finance, uh, I think a little over a month ago, released a whole long PDF uh, document uh, listing uh, line by line, uh, basically how much we owe, to whom we owe, and all those kinds of things, uh, um, sort of up to date as at June, 2021. So this is a huge plus. I mean, if uh, I invite the audience to go and look at this document if you haven't, but it is amazing in its detail, uh, something unprecedented. So again, that's a that's a big plus. Uh, so th those are the pluses. And I want to just talk a little bit about some concerns and I think we'll have a larger, longer discussion uh, here today. Uh, so the concern that I have is that I, one thing is to say, you know, the first 100 days are very important. And, uh, you know, this is an opportunity for a president to announce some seismic economic policy shifts. Uh, sadly, that seems to not have happened. Uh, you know, uh, you know, for example, one, the one concern I have is that uh, we don't as yet have a very solid economic recovery plan, right? So the choice of economic policy and economic recovery path, right? So we, we, we all know that the HH administration inherited an anemic economy saddled with much debt and lackluster economic performance. I think that's not without debate. Uh, one of the first things that we expected to see was a formulation of a robust and reasonably homegrown economic recovery plan. Uh, to this extent, one of the things that I thought would happen was that immediately he was sworn in, I mean, after a couple of days, maybe when he had settled in, and what signaled that this could happen was that he appointed the Minister of Finance before he appointed anybody else in his cabinet. So what I expected to see was some sort of national economic indaba, uh, you know, as a prelude to the selection of a widely acceptable national economic recovery plan. So I thought the president would converge, would sort of uh, convene a massive gathering, you know, somewhere at Mulungushi International Conference Center uh, with different constituents from across the country, not just the technocrats, not just the economists, not just the accountants, not just civil society, but wide ranging sector of society and would all converge there to uh, try to debate a, a, a popular economic recovery plan. Sadly, this hasn't happened. Uh, we don't have an economic recovery plan from the new government as, uh, as we speak. So we don't know uh, basically what their plans are. Since sadly, this hasn't happened. Uh, but what we certainly do know, as we can glean from different statements that have been made by the Minister of Finance or the Governor, right via the budget is that the plan, if at all there is a plan, it's anchored on the attainment of an IMF program. So we don't have a government's blueprint uh, plan, but what we do have is some sort of a plan that is anchored uh, on attaining an IMF uh, program, or IMF assistance. Uh, this certainly the Minister of Finance confirmed in the budget and told us that talks are underway with the IMF, uh, which means that the plan is anchored on austerity as a means to getting ourselves out of the economic quagmire, right? That's essentially what happens when you uh, when you are when you have, you're anchoring some sort of a plan on an IMF program that austerity cannot be avoided, right? Yeah. Um, and we now I'll be concluding shortly. And we now know, for example, the minister has already told us, uh, subsequent to the budget presentation in various appearances he's made here and there, uh, that we are trying we need to get rid of some of the subsidies, you know, that have been quite prominent in our economy. So energy subsidies, uh, I think, are going to go. Um, uh, right, so a subsidy to uh, electricity prices, a subsidy to petrol prices, this is going to go, uh, and we we know very well that this is going to create some hardship. 
right? I mean, this is without doubt, this is certainly going to create some hardship given that, uh, you know, a substantial uh, proportion of our population relies on those particular subsidies uh, to keep prices of uh, essential goods and services down. Uh, the governor of the central bank yesterday in, uh, in his first monetary policy statement after uh, being appointed has confirmed this as well, that we have to allow electricity and petrol prices to go up. So certainly this is a prelude to an agreement of an IMF program. Um, I, we're going to discuss some of this much later, but I just want to put it out there that, you know, a lot of the debate in the country uh, is making these things as though they're inevitable, right? I just want to say that economic policy is not a science per se, but it's about making choices, right? So we've made the choice to lift the subsidies. Uh, at the same time, we've made a choice to, re to reduce uh, corporate income taxes, right? So they've gone down from 35% to 30%. We've made a choice to make uh, mineral royalty taxes tax deductible. So these are policy choices. One could have made different choices, for example, uh, phase out the subsidies in a gradual way or keep them there, but instead try to raise uh, uh, revenue in, from the corporate sector and mining sector. So these are choices. This is not science, but choices. Also, I want to put it out there as a last point before I give it up, give it to my other colleagues, is that empirically this idea that you can you know, you can recover from austerity. What is often called expansionary, expansionary fiscal austerity is uh, empirically an unsound idea. So I think I'm very worried about the potential to recover via austerity. Uh, Chris, these are some brief remarks that I wanted to make, but I imagine we'll have a much more robust debate uh, shortly. Brilliant as usual, uh, Dr. Chilwa. And uh, I hope uh, since we're brothers now, I can call you Grieve. Uh, since you're calling me Chris, but uh, certainly one of the things before we hand over to um, our, our other colleagues to give us a sense, and here I'll be inviting uh, Laura Mitty to, to join us, is, is maybe to problematize uh, this question about austerity and what you anticipate as uh, reforms that are geared towards uh, bringing in the IMF as a crucial partner do you think that this will really result in a lackluster economic reform policy that is not much different from the other structural adjustment programs that have been recommended by the various Bretton Woods institutions in Zambia, Dr. Chilla? Uh, uh, thanks, Chris. Uh, I mean, to, to answer that question, one has to look at the evidence, right? So, you know, it's not a, a sort of... A, uh, a thing of personal opinion is uh, looking at the evidence. Um, sadly, austerity does cause pain. So this is with, with, not without debate. When you remove those subsidies on energy and electricity, the prices will go up. Yeah. All right. And when the prices go up, certainly it's going to cause pain. I think the question is, will that pain be temporary and then we see recovery in the future? My reading of the evidence suggests no, right? Austerity depresses the economy and it, it so almost becomes like a, a vicious cycle. That's right. my worry. Yeah, that, that's my worry. And I think the evidence is quite clear that this kind of policy approach, it doesn't create jobs, it causes pain. So I worry about that. That's why I'd, I'd hoped we had the large national economic endeavor to, ex to debate some of these issues and to say to ourselves, okay, these are the trade-offs. Are these acceptable trade-offs? Are we going to trade off subsidies, reduction yeah. of subsidies, and then give the corporate sector uh, some tax relief. These are things that we should have debated in an e economic endeavor sort of place and then and then accept them. That, that's my point. But I guess we can have much more de debate much later in this uh, session. Thank, thank, thank you so much, Preev. Uh, let, let me bring in uh, the executive director of, for the Alliance for Community Action, uh, Ms. Laura Mitty. Um, Ms. Mitty, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, just before we uh, give you your 10 minutes for introduction, I was very fascinated to hear uh, from my brother Grieve that what he had noted was really a more transparent and accountable uh, situation occurring, at least with regards to the manner in which uh, economic policy is being established in Zambia, a refreshing change from the past. Are we seeing at the opening up of space, at least within civil society, and uh, generally with regards to democracy, as we are seeing uh, in the economic space? Maybe that's one thing that you can answer for me uh, before you go into uh, your 10 minutes of observations. Um, 
Thank you very much, Chris. Um, I, I would say when it comes to the question of uh, civic space, it's certainly much more open. Uh, there's, <laughs> there's no comparison, it's night and day. Um, so even some of the strategies we had put in place, you know, like in the last few years, our planning was always always included how do you sidestep the shrinking space, how do you sidestep the police and all that kind of thing. We're certainly sitting with these uh, plans that feel redundant right now because we don't uh, exactly need them. And uh, maybe it's, it's simple things like um, entry into the ACA uh, trains councillors, I mean, routinely projects we've had for a long time. The difference between gathering a group of councillors now and gathering them just a few months ago, again, is, is, is really huge. So what you're getting is less fear, I think, uh, within the, the, the subnational structures uh, who usually would say you have to bring us later from the PS, you have to bring us a letter from this person and that person, or just simply just, would just ignore you. So I think in terms of, 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 of the space, I'd say it is uh, quite open. But to go um, beyond that, I, I think what I'll say is that I'll start by saying the 100-day marker in the in a presidency is essentially a very short period. Uh, I don't know how it was picked, but uh, it is, I think, more uh, something, it's more a, a, a period in which you can um, gauge the direction of a presidency rather than uh, any concrete change. And so that is where I think we find ourselves. Um, and uh, so that is what my comments will be. What What is the direction that this presidency looks like is going on? Um, on the issues that matter to the ACA and uh, maybe other governance uh, actors uh, within the country. Um, I would say in, in the first thing I think is, is, is the question you raised, it's just the reduction of tensions within the country and a sense of, a sense of uh, freedom, if, if, if I, I can um, term it that way. So, we had to reach the stage where there was uh, quite a level of fear, uh, self-censorship within the media, um, polarization, the conversation, uh, anybody critiquing the government was almost, even if it was fair comment, was seen as brave. You know, you, you had to be brave to talk about debt. You had to be brave to talk about this, talk about that. And I think that level of uh, political tension has reduced um, quite critically. And I think also linked to that is the ability of Zambians to express themselves. Right. So what, we have, what we've seen uh, since August 12th is almost noise. There's a din. You know, it's, 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 it's anybody who can say anything, whether they have something to say or not, it's just talking. You almost feel like people were gagged. So now uh, you, if, 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 if you have a mouth, you speak. Essentially, is where, is where we are yeah, uh, in Zambia. And so that's, especially if you go into social media, you just think, my goodness, you know, everybody's an expert on anything. It's quite, um, how can I say, it's, it's, there's a sense of, relief when you, when, you, when you see that. I've, I've seen people, for example, on social media who I thought had forgotten existed. Yeah. <laughs> if you see what I mean, they had gone quiet and there's, there's uh, a lot of comment. I think what is most noticeable is the extent to which the now opposition party, the, the, the patriotic front, is able to express itself and criticize the government uh, quite robustly and go from radio station to radio station, TV station to TV station, hold press conferences. This was entirely impossible before. So that, I think, is, 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 is a good change, which we hope can be uh, sustained. Um, there is the, I, I think this, uh, uh, Grieve raised this issue. I found that there's been due diligence on um, appointments of important uh, officers. So the economic, uh, the, the officers of overseeing the economy, like Griff said, I think uh, were appointed in such a way that it's very difficult to, uh, to criticize. Maybe people would have had different choices, but the people in these offices, the Minister of Finance, the Secretary to the, to the Treasury, the, the, the uh, Bank of Zambia Governor, 
uh, uh, respected uh, professionals. Then, of course, we recently had the Chief Justice. That is an office I was very worried about because, as you might know, our judiciary has really lost its uh, respect uh, within, in, in the country. And we feared that uh, if... The uh, if the chief justice was appointed in order to keep the political actors happy uh, or to be a friend of the political actors would be, would be trouble. I think this is one office in the last, uh, I don't know, maybe 20 years of, of, of observing Zambian, um, uh, the Zambian uh, political and, and, and general um, atmosphere. We have, I've not heard a single person criticize the, the, the new uh, chief justice, which is a really good thing, because, uh, as you know, the judiciary is the final arbiter in, 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 in all matters in the country. And we had reached a stage in which nobody respected the chief justice, or at least there was a lot of criticism. So that, that, that has been very good. Um, at the ACO, we, we were particularly happy with with what looked like a, a budget, what a budget that focuses on the social sector. Yeah. So decentralization has been a big issue for us in the in the ACA. And in, in terms of direction, it does again look like this is going to be a presidency that seeks inclusion. Whether he succeeds or whether the UPND succeeds or not is a different question. But the conversation about the importance of uh sharing the national cake better bringing in rural folk making making understanding that living in a rural area does not give you a substandard citizenry um i think as is also really uh, great in terms of direction the extent to which that will be possible again given uh, what uh Grieve was saying might be difficult we, we've got for example free education something i really like but how will we be able to fund it in, a, in, a, in an uh, environment in which we're going in the direction of austerity? So what, what I think what, what I would say is that, uh, oh, and I think the, the last thing I'll say is I've really, maybe uh, some, some people will not agree with me, but I, I, I really like that President Hichilema has avoided weakening institutions that hold government to account. Right. So this is the first time that we've had nobody from civil society appointed into government, not one person. Nobody from the media appointed into government. My fear was that President Hichilema would feel the pressure to reward voices, you know, like to reward people who spoke up uh, uh, for, for against maybe the, the PF and in a way supported the coming into office of the UPND. I really like that civil society has remained intact. We can do our work, we can hold this government to account. Because what usually happens is people are picked off and in no time, civil society is, ha is having to reconstitute itself. So I'm particularly excited about that and I hope, I'd like to appeal to President Ichile, but to leave it that way. Do not appoint people from civil society into government because all it does is weaken uh, civil society takes away people with experience. The same thing with the media. So I've, I've been very happy with that. From the point of uh, weakness, I think he, uh, this, this government has a very disjointed PR machinery. You know, like half the time you wonder a bit what's going on. Too many voices. Who's speaking? Is it the party person? Is it this person? You know, so actually UPAD was very weak in PR, even in opposition. They've brought that with them into, into government. Into government. I hope they can improve that. I also think some ministers are very weak. Um, like, I, I don't know. <laughs> I suppose there, there is rewards, you know. There's the whole question of rewards, uh, but there's a there are some ministers who I I will not I will not name anyone. I don't want to get myself uh, into trouble, but I do think <laughs> that there's some ministers that have no business being <laughs> big ministers right now at a time when we have such uh, uh, um, so many issues to deal with. I thought that the PSs especially, my God, there's some PSs there that are just political cadres that get it, but with no business being political cadres. But I guess. Uh, it's probably a little difficult if you are the person in power, but yeah, there are people I would never appoint that are in office right now. Thank you very much, Chris. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Miss Michi, for your for your keen observations. Uh, I do wish you would have shared some of those names, but maybe our next uh, guest, uh, Mr. Boniface uh, Chimbe, who is executive director. Uh, for the Southern African Center for Constructive Resolution of Disputes. 
can give us an insight into this. But before you you you, you give us these um, insights, I, I just wanted to ask you a question on the balance from what we've heard from the preceding uh, speakers. It does appear that there seems to be an opening of space, both uh, socially, economically, politically, and and otherwise. However, one of the key things that is being speculated on here, Mr. Chimbe, is the question around impunity and the use of anti-corruption uh, quests to basically punish uh, previous political opponents. And here, in this regard, I'll ask you a very direct question. Do you believe that there is any credence to the speculation that we're hearing uh, on the streets of Zambia that uh, there might be a move to remove, remove uh, the immunity of uh, former President Lungu as part of a, a, a means of curbing this impunity, but some say also as really a way to uh, punish President Lungu for what might be perceived as uh, previous excesses. Uh, what's your view about this, uh, uh, Mr. Chimbe? Uh, Mr. Chimbe, do you, do you mind unmuting yourself? All right. I I I hope. Yes, we can we can hear you now. Go ahead. Okay, thank you so very much. Good afternoon to you, Mr. Maraleng. Uh, good afternoon to my colleagues, uh, Laura and uh, uh, Greaves. Uh, first and foremost, allow me to appreciate uh, the Good Governors Africa, uh, but also the Mail and Guardian for creating this very, very important platform uh, for us to be able to share insights uh, in the 100 days of, of President Hijirema's administration and indeed the new dawn uh, government, uh, the 100 days uh, in which we as SACO describe it to be as a stable, a largely stable, uh, peaceful, and the work uh, in progress. Uh, in terms of uh, the question that you have posed uh, as regards to the fight against corruption and ending uh, impunity, it is actually a very big question. Uh, it is a big question in that in this country we do have a history in the presidents uh, of uh, presidents' uh, immunities uh, being lifted. Uh, for example, former President uh, Chiruba, may he so rest in peace, uh, his immunity was lifted and he was prosecuted uh, for what were perceived or deemed to be corrupt uh, 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 practices whilst uh, he was uh, in office. Um, the trial did drag on for long, and if you ask uh, many Zambians today whether they are satisfied with what uh, that particular trial brought out, many will tell you that, well, uh, it leaved much to be desired. Uh, perhaps it wasn't even worth it to have uh, gone through uh, that path. But the, the whole issue or the whole idea was to ensure that uh, we do uh, wage the fight against corruption and send home a message, a very clear message, that if you do engage yourself in acts of corruption, you will be brought to book. Uh, out went uh, former President Chiluwa, uh, President, uh, former President Rupia Banda came in, uh, there were a cause, similar cause to what we are having right now for his immunity to be lifted. And indeed, his immunity was lifted. Uh, there were some uh, actions taken against him. And again, if you asked Zambians as to whether they are happy with uh, the outcome of that uh, particular trial, you will probably get some mixed feelings uh, in that um, uh, regard. Not much was recovered as compared to what Zambians thought would actually uh, be recovered. So on account of uh, the happenings to our former two former presidents, there was an idea that uh, in the amended constitution number two of 2016, we need to ensure that the issue of your immunity, lifting a president's immunity, is entrenched so that it is not used as a loose political weapon to be waged against perceived uh, opponents. Uh, so that entrenchment now requires a two-thirds majority uh, for the president's immunity uh, to be uh, lifted. But over and above that, it requires a parliament style like or a Senate or US Senate style like trial uh, where 
uh, the president will have to come before parliament. Uh, he will have to go uh, through a trial uh, uh, for his uh, corrupt uh, actions. And uh, based on the uh, evidence that is brought before the courts, uh, a verdict will have to, uh, to be given. But, but that whole process to lift the president's immunity, to get the right evidence, and ultimately to be able to retrieve that which the people of Zambia would uh, make them satisfied, it takes a, a very, very long process. You are probably looking at uh, two, three, uh, if not um, uh, four years. So uh, the issue is that uh, it will take long. Uh, the whole process is entrenched. Uh, and again, the idea uh, from what uh, we are observing as SACOD, uh, from the new Don government is to send the message that corruption will not be tolerated. I think they have been very clear in as far as uh, uh, political will is concerned that uh, uh, corruption, there will, there will be zero tolerance towards uh, uh, corruption, uh, previous and current, uh, including future acts uh, uh, of corruption. So uh, it, it, the, the issue is all about the rule of law, uh, which the new deal government and President Hijilema have been very strong on. Uh, that Zambia will be premised on the rule of law, that the rule of law will be implemented, and that, and that there will be zero tolerance on the fight against corruption. So uh, it is against that background that we are hearing these voices uh, on, um, uh, present, on the lifting of President Lungu's um, uh, immunity. Uh, in our view, if there is strong enough evidence uh, against our former president, uh, for his immunity uh, to be lifted. We are not against the rule of law. The rule of law has to take uh, its course. But we must not make the same mistakes that we made in the previous, with our previous presidents, uh, lifting their immunities and recovering nothing and ultimately bringing some kind of ridicule, if not embarrassment, to the nation. Uh, in view of that, we would want to support one of the avenues that the New Deal government has actually undertaken. Uh, that is, to say, well, look, uh, Zambia's economy is not in the best shape. What the people want is to see resources in the in, in resources uh, in their economy being channeled into productive sectors. So why don't we instead prioritize the recovery uh, of quote unquote stolen state assets? Get that money. Uh, go into some kind of an, an understanding and agreement with those individuals who are, who, who are perceived to have stolen these state assets. Let them give those state assets up. And uh, once they're in the custody of the government, then the government begins the process of redistributing that wealth. Uh, in our view, and again, coming strictly from a peace building point of view, uh, we've heard some, some make arguments that, well, look, uh, that is not punishment enough. We must prosecute. We must uh, ensure that retributive justice uh, take, take its full course. Uh, there, there is need in, uh, for, for us to have a proper understanding of restorative justice, give uh, an opportunity for restorative justice processes uh, to take root in the country, uh, ultimately ensure that there is a recovery of these assets uh, and let these be channeled uh, to uh, the productive sectors and to the people who need them the most. So there are two schools of thoughts. Uh, you know, uh, the international system has got two forms of administering justice, the retributive form and the restorative form. And we are in support of the restorative form of justice that the new Dawn government has undertaken. Suffice to say, that in, in, in agreeing with Laura, they need to do much more better explanation in terms of the course of action that they are taking, uh, the benefits that seek, seek to accrue to the country, and how different this course of action is compared to the past ones, where we have gone the prosecution uh, route and have achieved very little at the end of it all. Now, uh, Mr. Marilyn, with your indulgence uh, in terms of uh, 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 giving our insights uh, in the 100 days uh, of uh, President Hijilema's uh, administration and the New Dawn government's administration. Uh, we believe that the 100 days uh, have shown the nation uh, a vision that uh, President Hijilema holds, that vision both domestically as well as internationally. Uh, and to be very uh, precise, one is able to get hold of this vision from various documents that the head of state has been able to share uh, with the nation and in the international community. Number one, uh, the, the, the victory speech, the initial victory speech that he gave at, uh, at, at the community uh, house shortly after he was declared uh, the winner of the 2021 general elections, where he focused much more uh, solidly on issues of inclusion, peace and unity 
very clear. Number two, on his inauguration speech, uh, when he was being inaugurated uh, as the seventh uh, president of the Republic of Zambia. Uh, uh, over and above everything else that he touched on, again, he was very clear uh, on the need to ensure that there is inclusion, there is unity, and that there is peace uh, in the country. Uh, the, the, the third point, uh, or the third speech that the head of state uh, gave was that when he, he opened the parliament again being inconsistent with what he had shared uh, in the other two speeches that uh, i've already spoken about uh, he was very clear uh, on the need for inclusion on the need for peace uh, and on the need for unity uh, the fourth uh, platform is that when he went uh, to the united nations general assembly uh, where he informed uh, the world uh, on the need or on zambia's uh, role in as far as inclusion peace and unity is concerned not only for the republic of zambia but also for the region, the continent, and indeed the entire uh, globe. And of course, uh, when you come to the practicalities of the speeches that uh, he gave as regards to inclusion, uh, peace, uh, uh, unity, uh, you have to look at the national budget uh, that uh, the Honorable Minister of Finance uh, did uh, furnish to the nation. And just like, again, my colleague Laura did point out, a very inclusive uh, budget touching on pretty much every uh, single uh, sector. Uh, over and above these uh, five different platforms that are, are, are shared, of course, there is a, a UPND uh, party manifesto, which again is very clear uh, in terms of issues of inclusion, uh, unity, uh, and um, uh, peace. Now, uh, the, 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 there is a reason why the head of state uh, has been very consistent on these issues. Uh, number one uh, is uh, the experience that he himself went through. Uh, in the many years that he was in, in, in opposition, uh, issues of marginalization, issues uh, of uh, exclusion, uh, if you will, and issues of being mistreated almost as if he is not a Zambian. Uh, that's number one, personal experience. Number two, uh, a, a feeling by some section uh, of Zambia society uh, that uh, for a number of years there was exclusion in as far as representation of the different ethnic groups uh, in our country uh, is concerned. Uh, and that those uh, who were represented at the national level, say cabinet or perhaps senior government uh, uh, positions, permanent secretaries, uh, directors, and so on and so forth, uh, came from uh, certain uh, regions at the exclusion of other uh, regions. Uh, so there was also a feeling that was embedded uh, in society, coupled with acts of political violence that were happening in the country made everybody become very fearful uh, in terms of what they were talking about or what they were doing uh, but also uh, other issues in as far as uh, the state of zambia's peace is concerned so just very quickly uh, mr Maroling, uh, if you look at the 2021 global peace um, uh, index uh, it has it makes very sad reading for the state of zambia's peace in 2020 zambia was ranked as the fourth most peaceful country uh, in sub-saharan africa uh, a few months later a year later in 2021 zambia is ranked as the 13th most peaceful country uh, in sub-saharan africa dropping many points uh, just within a few months time uh, in 2020 zambia was ranked as the 44th most peaceful country in the world and the quality of Zambia's peace was similar to Scandinavian countries such as Sweden. In 2021, according to the Global Peace Index, Zambia's levels of peacefulness have dwindled, and now Zambia is ranked as the 71st most peaceful country uh, in the world. So there has also been a worrying trend in terms of Zambia's levels of peacefulness. Hence, the need to focus on issues of inclusion, peace, uh, and unity in the country. So to that effect, what we have seen in the last 100 days, or in the first 100 days of the President Hikilimaza administration, has been an attempt to ensure that there is representation of all the 10 regions of the Republic of Zambia uh, where governance uh, and politics is concerned. So if you look at the cabinet, uh, almost all the 10 provinces of the country are represented. If you come down to, 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 to permanent secretaries, to district commissioners, and of course uh, at, 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 at the levels of directors and other senior government positions, that is still work in progress. But if you look at these positions that have been, uh, 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 that, that, that have been released to the public, again, you do see a, a deliberate effort uh, to see to it that uh, uh, many Zambians 
from all regions and indeed from all the ethnic groupings that make up this country are also represented in this uh, decision uh, making positions and maybe most 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 most, uh, most crucially uh sorry uh, Mr. Marling, uh, most crucially, what the New Dawn government has done is to give a lot of power to the office of the vice president to deliberately undertake uh, peace measures, peace building measures uh, uh, from the continental point of view, uh, such as, uh, or namely, the continental structure of vulnerability and resilience assessment at a country level being called the country structure of vulnerability and resilience assessment that as Zambia has voluntarily gone into to assess our levels of vulnerabilities, put mitigation factors or measures into those and out that we continue to build the necessary peace that we need to build as a country. So there is now a deliberate effort to ensure that issues of inclusion, issues of peace, issues of unity are being taken care of. But of course, there are concerns here and there, which I'm sure we shall be able to delve into uh, as we go on with the program. Absolutely. And, and, and thank you very much for your in-depth uh, contribution and what you've been able to uh, glean as key policy initiatives, inclusion, peace, unity. But I want to bring in very quickly um, Ms. Laura Meaty here into um, the, the, the conversation and ask you a very pointed question, given what has been shared by uh, my brother Boniface, uh, who has indicated those three uh, key highlights that we've been able to glean, inclusion, peace, and unity, which is basically given the fact that public trust in key state institutions was so low previously have we seen and i know you 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 said that it's maybe a little bit too early uh to 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 judge at this stage but have we seen any structural policy reform initiatives to strengthen key state institutions that can indicate this move towards better inclusion peace and unity as was shared uh by boniface miss mitty um i wouldn't say policy but maybe implementation so we've had pronouncements for example the president made a pronouncement that um bond should be police bond should be uh, given by the police and people should not stay in cells unnecessarily long like was happening under pf and that, I think, has largely been uh, implemented. Even sometimes uh, to, uh, citizens feeling like some people should have stayed a little bit longer, even if even, uh, you know, poor arrested. Who, who would have kept others is behind bars? But I think but, but that's what is. But you think these moves are enough to bolster <laughs> the kind of confidence in public institutions that we need to see, especially coming from this president, who I believe was brought in on the basis of trust that he would reform uh, quite radically these institutions and quite rapidly. That, and that's what I'm saying, that we have not seen anything that is structural or policy. What we've yes. seen is pronouncements, which right. uh, in, in the typical um, manner of African countries, what the president says goes. Yes. But if tomorrow, there was someone else. Nothing has changed structurally to prevent the police, the police not giving. Although I don't know what you can change about bond because bond is lawful. It should have been, uh, uh, for example, uh, given even when it wasn't. So that was going against the law. Uh, yes. I, 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 I would say so. So you have you, you have the question of the of, of, of bond. You have the question of uh, the national broadcaster, for example. Again, it's just a pronouncement. Which has which which has said report freely. Uh, you don't. They have to be the president all the time. And uh, I think ZNBC has become a lot more watchable. I mean, you you can suffer the news, which had become quite insufferable. Um, again, I think what you need is for the broadcaster to be independent. You know, like the, maybe the 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 boss to. to to not be appointed by the minister, that's what would make it uh, st structured. So as things stand, we are still waiting for the um, uh, access to information legislation, right. for example. We would like the public order law ch changed. Uh, so what so, we've had- So, so, so Laura, let, 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 let me hold you there and bring in Boniface, uh, given what you have just said. Boniface, Laura is saying, look, lots of pronouncements around 
inclusion, peace, and unity, but very little in terms of structural reform. Is it too soon? And give us specifics on the structural reforms that you'd like to see established. Uh, Boniface. Sure. Um, in, in terms of uh, structural reforms, uh, one of the things that the New Dawn government has made very clear is that uh, they will reform the Public Order Act. Now, the Public Order Act yes, has been... Yes, a, Boniface, yes. I, 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 I get they, they, they are saying will, but I, I, I am specifically saying to you today, what are those specific provisions that should be not not driven from the uh, office of the president but what do you believe as saccord should be the key policy changes that we're seeing well uh the, the key policy changes are really are around uh pieces of legislation that have contributed to structural violence, uh, if I may put it uh, that way, in our country. So from a support point of view, the reform of the Public Order Act, which has been a source of conflict since 1964, is paramount. Uh, the manner in which it is administered, number one, the levels of protection it gives to the Zambia Police Service, which uh, is key and very important to professionalism, is number two, uh, issues of uh, time frames and responsibilities between the rights holders and the duty bearers. If I want to enjoy a certain procession, I, I should be notified in good time. I should not be notified 10 minutes or, 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 or one minute before a procession is due that due to con security concerns, you cannot proceed. Those were serious sources of conflict. But over and above that, in view or in line, uh, with the fact that we now have a transparent and accountable uh, government, we are hoping to introduce new measures in the Public Order Act, for example, including technological innovations in terms of notifications uh, for the enjoyments of these freedoms of expression association as well as assembly, so that irrespective of where you are, Mr. Marolin, Every yes. citizen is able to track that, uh, okay, Laura Miti uh, did submit this notification five days to the Zambia Police Service. This is the status, and these are the reasons, and so on and so forth. So we need to digitize the manner in which we enjoy uh, some of these freedoms so that we reduce the amount of tension uh, 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 that surround it. But over right. and above that, uh, Mr. Maroland, uh, the, the issue of the Continental Structure of Vulnerability and Resilience Assessment, yes. CSERA, to which yeah. now Zambia is uh, undertaking, will further provide very specific structural policy directions uh, that we need to undertake as a country in various thematic areas. Good Fantastic. And, 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 and one of those thematic, one of those thematic issues, uh, Mr. Chimbe, uh, relates to the economy. And I want to bring in now um, Dr. Chelwa. Doc, Dr. Chelwa, you, 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 we, we, we're hearing that reform is crucial, uh, especially in the short period of trust uh, that is uh, given to the president, this 100 days that we're looking at. And we haven't seen much in terms of structural reforms that we're anticipating. Uh, we're hoping that maybe next week when the 100 days comes up, we'll begin to see it. But having said so, um, you, you, you know, you, you refer to the fact that there needs to be discussions with multilateral financial institutions, particularly regarding Zambia's spiraling, uh, spiraling debt crisis. What is the basis of it and how does uh, President Hichilema uh, position uh, these discussions uh, specifically around the debt crisis in, 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 in Zambia? Because really, the, the, the people will expect key interventions in the economy to be made. Uh, thanks, Chris. And, and I think, uh, I mean, I agree with my other colleagues when they say 100 days is too soon, uh, but also 100 days is a lot, right? And I, I think one of the things that we ought to recognize is that uh, a president has a little political capital in the, in yep. the initial phases of their presidency. And I think what uh, disappointed me a little bit is that uh, President Hichilema had already made up his mind about the direction of how on how he was going to deal with the debt. I think one of his yep. first interviews with the BBC was pretty much saying, we are in trouble, which was true, and we're going to go the IMF route. Uh, and that worried me a little bit. And I think what we needed at that time was a lot of people to come to the table and brainstorm together and come up with something quite new and innovative, right? I mean, the folks who we owe money to are not machines. They are people as well. We all 
hedge funds, we owe banks, we owe bilateral, we owe uh, uh, countries. And I think what I thought would have happened, again, that's why that endeavor was very important. We yep. strategize, how do we bring these people together? And we say, look, can we restructure? Can we defer? Can you forgive us? Can you give us room to breathe? Can we think about what's happening with the mines, with the copper price going up? Can we do something with that? So I think what happened initially is the president really cast us on one path. And that path was uh, deemed inevitable. And I think yeah. it is not inevitable. It was a choice. And but but, but here, grief, uh, you know, being an outsider looking in, uh, maybe some of these uh, financial institutions, be they in the public and private space, are saying too much rope has been given uh, to Zambia, specifically when we look at uh, maybe the past 10 or so years around uh, the economy. And that by uh, providing further extensions, what you're effectively doing is enabling uh, this current administration. And what is really required are clear guide rails uh, that stick down the kind of austerity measures that we expect to come out. What, what's your view? I mean, uh, I mean, yeah, it's partly true that we've been given a lot of rope. But again, that's why 100 days is so important. Because that first 100 days, it's not just the Zambians who are giving you benefit. It is also outsiders. And I think one of the things that we did see is when he was elected and inaugurated, international markets reacted in a certain way. And that way was a positive way, basically saying we trust this man, we trust his stewardship of the Zambian economy. That was a time to strike, in my mind, right? My opinion, that was a time to say, okay, you guys who trust me, let's get together and talk about the debt. Right. right. We are clearly running out of time. We are running out of breathing room. Can you give us space? Because if you don't give me space, then you will force me to inflict pain on my people, which is what's going to happen now. And I worry about what that pain will do uh, a year or two down the line insofar as, uh, you know, trust for the Hichilema presidency is concerned. I want the president yes. to succeed. I mean, he's a far better president than the last one. But I worry that this policy direction will make it very difficult for him in a year or two. Yeah, but, but round about uh, this time in November 2020, about a year ago, Zambia defaulted on servicing its debt obligations. And this had serious implications uh, with regards to the way in which financial institutions were viewing Zambia. Um, currently, we, we, we have this COVID pandemic. Is President Hichilema constrained really on what he can do? and what he can promise financial institutions with regards to debt, the obligation to service this debt, uh, given uh, the COVID moment that many African countries are facing. Are we being unfair? Are we expecting too much? Uh, Chris, the COVID, bring up the COVID story, I think is important context, right? I mean, certainly uh, he, he is constrained in, in the kind of things that one can do, but also he's a head of state, right? I mean, presidents are, are uh, remembered for what they did in moments of crisis. Right? I, I go back to Barack Obama, right? Barack Obama came in as president at the heart of the financial crisis, which George W. H. Bush, George W. Bush, sorry, had created. And I think right. what he did in the first hundred days, if you recall, were rather ambitious and radical uh, policy. One of the things that he didn't do was austerity, right? So he passed a stimulus bill that was almost a trillion dollars, as we recall. Uh, and I th this is why I think this is what we should have tried to do in the beginning. When we had that euphoria, that favorable, positive uh, view, we should have quickly engaged these guys, not committed right. to a path, right? Uh -huh. Hope, uh, 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 sort of try to figure out the many paths. Again, economic yes. policy is not science. Most people think it is science. No, it is yeah. choices, right? Uh -huh. So we made a choice. And I think that wasn't the correct choice. Interesting uh, key insights there. And I want to bring in uh, Laura Meaty into the discussion here because uh, one of the things that has been uh, pointed out is that maybe um, the worst thing that you can do in any crisis is nothing. Yes. Um, so what are, in your view, the successful uh, or rather the key success points that President Hichilema has to involve himself in? if you were sitting there at the table advising him uh, in the next coming 100 days for him to be seen to be doing something, not simply uh, waiting uh, for uh, maybe external uh, community to provide uh, points of intervention. What's your view here? 
Oh, sorry, you're, you're on mute, Laura. You might want to admit yourself. Okay. So I'd say the low hanging fruits are, of course, the legislative changes. Those would be extremely important, entirely in his hands. Uh, attention to the Constitution as well, which, uh, while we are quite um, exhausted <laughs> with looking at our Constitution, I get the sense that President Hitchilema so far doesn't look like someone wanting to create uh, power around himself. So maybe this is our chance to 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 have a, a, to to write our constitution or amend the constitution in a manner that is not designed to keep uh, the president in office. So I, I think legislative changes uh, sorry, uh, 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 and that uh, we're going to have to see what happens uh, when they the, the in the in the new year with the disbursement of, of, of the budget. So for for example, for us at the ACA ensuring that there is not new scandals uh, around corruption. So he has to keep a very strong handle on his own new ministers, um, his cadres, the people in his, in, in, in his party. Uh, we keep saying that whether you like it or not, 10 years of the PF taught the UPND a lesson that if you're in power, you make money. If right. you're in power, you get rich. So there are quite a few people within the UPAD whose only purpose for fighting so hard was in order to get rich. <laughs> okay, uh, so far from what we've seen is from the president, he himself, well, he doesn't need to get rich, lucky guy. You know, like he's already got his money. But maybe that's our chance as well to have a president who himself does not need money, who's then able to keep a strong handle on those. Uh, so corruption, I think, uh, the prevention of ongoing corruption is important. When we have the next Auditor General's report, we'd like to see a real difference in terms of, uh, first of all, the actual incidence of loss of money, but better internal controls. So it's, it's, it's systems, it's procedures. And I think that is where we have a problem. Unfortunately, right. you, you, uh, you have a president coming in and a party coming in where so much in the country is broken, our education system, our health system, all these things. So somewhere we do have to make changes. I like that he has given, he seems to give authority to, to, to his ministers. I would like to see the each minister take full control of their own ministry so that it's less about the president, which is why appointments are extremely important. The CJ is now in the judiciary. It's his job to clean up the mess that is there. It is the job of the minister of education to be heard about systemic changes that we need within the Ministry of Education. So he needs to get his ministers working and sounding like they understand why they are in office. Right. And, and, and key points that you're raising here, but forgive me if I sound a bit obtuse in asking this question to Boniface, which is that as much as the legislative reforms and the constitutional reforms are great, we cannot eat the constitution. I was yeah. reading as I was looking at the uh, doing a bit of research around uh, this discussion that we're having today, that some of the key uh, aid organizations are saying yeah that up to one and a half million Zambians face severe food insecurity and terrible impacts resultant from climate change impacts. One of them indicated by this uh, uh, food insecurity. What are we doing and what are we seeing being done by the current administration uh, to address this issue uh, of these uh, nearly 1.5 million people who are facing this insecurity? Boniface. That's, that's a great question, Mr. Marolin. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, in the previous uh, uh, government, the PF government, they used to say, we can't eat roads. Um, a couple of things. Uh, num 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 number one, I, I think President Hitchinem and the new Dawn government have to be able to manage expectations. Uh, there were a lot of campaign promises uh, and a lot of people tend to believe or feel that somehow magically a lot of things that are were promised will happen uh, almost automatically. So the new Dawn government has to be able to engage in expectation management and this has to be done in a constructive manner. 
you explain to people how long certain things will take you explain to people what challenges you are having and you explain to people whether you're going to accomplish it or not so that from there you are able to build the trust so building trust and uh, managing uh, 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 expectations is, ex is incredibly key and this must be done in a manner that is not defensive because the more you become defensive the more you infuriate the people that's number one number two it is important that the new dawn government prioritizes disbursing for example the constituency development funds cdf the 25.7 million quarter to each and every single constituency in this country on time on right. time and ensure that they engage aggressively the duty bearers in the form of local uh, councils uh, members of parliament and councillors in building the right capacities of local communities to be able to engage in entrepreneurial work so that they're able to access this fund and be able to make ends meet within their localities and forget the issue of having to come to Lusaka to look for money but rather begin the process of looking for that money within, the, within their uh, uh, localities that's number two number three related to this is that as you are aware one of the structural issues that the new dawn government and president hitlerem have done is to ban the issues of cadarism in markets uh bus stations or public goods uh if you will uh that issue has been minimized although it, it pops up every now and then it's a process it may take time at least if you speak to most zambians there is a feeling that that issue of cadarism has dwindled uh, what now needs to be done is to ensure that these cadres are empowered in a legal and a lawful manner so that they're able to have access to finances and be in a position to fend or feed their families. In you know the, the issue of cadarism, yes, it was illegal, but you had many people feeding off their families, uh, taking their children to school, building houses out of such an illegal vice. It needs to be now legalized. It needs to be it needs to be formalized, and the new dawn government has to move with deliberate haste. And we feel that if they do that, it will go a long way in ensuring that there is adequate resources in the communities, uh, cadres are empowered, and everybody has access to a little finances which they are able to eat as opposed to the legal reforms, which are incredibly paramount in as far of in as far as addressing structural violence is concerned or the roads which frankly speaking still need to be built in the most parts of the country because that's the only way to bring about a sustainable economy as per the chinese saying that if you want to get rich build a road indeed let's let's let's, let's bring in uh my brother grieve here dr chelo uh dr chelo uh, one of the things as i was uh, looking at this issue around food insecurity was one of the key drivers economically towards that, or that could further uh, make food insecurity a serious problem, which is uh, the rate of inflation, growing inflation in Zambia. In terms of uh, the economic interventions, what are you looking out for uh, for this administration uh, led by President H.H. Uh, to be focusing on uh, to sort out uh, this inflation uh, that is causing food prices to skyrocket in certain instances. Uh, uh, thanks uh, for, for that question, Chris. In fact, uh, that's an opportune question because there's a debate in the country now, started yesterday, about the drivers of inflation. Uh, you know, the new governor made a statement, his monetary policy statement yesterday, where the monetary policy committee of the central bank has increased the policy rate, the equivalent of a uh, of um in south africa you have uh, I, I forget again what it's called i, I used to teach this to my students uh you know the, the you know so they, that's when they, yeah so they, basically the monetary policy rate has gone up and the the governor has gone up by about 0 0.5 percent 0 0.5 of a percentage point and the governor of the central bank uh, justified it on the basis that he foresees or the committee foresees inflationary pressures in the in the future uh right. today coincidentally the Stati national statistics office has released uh a report which says inflation has gone down right so the big debate in the country is uh, is the governor you know uh, in good stead to be doing this increasing the policy rate which will inc increase the cost of borrowing at a time when an economy is in depression the again i think this is yes. yeah, yeah the repo rate is there exactly is, it, is this the right time to increase uh, the repo rate when an economy is in 
recession, it is depressed. So again, I think this is some of the stuff, uh, I mean, sort of akin to what Laura said about the lack of coordination on the media communication front. I see a lack of coordination on the economy front. And I right. think this kind of lack of coordination requires some sort of, you know, in, in, the president in South Africa has a very nice presidential advisory council, right? It requires a coordinating mechanism so that fiscal policy, monetary policy are aligned and they are live to the realities of the moment that we're in a recessionary moment. And what you do when you're in a recessionary moment, you try to get people to spend a little bit more. We need to get our businesses to borrow and spend. But this move seems to be doing the reverse. Again, it speaks to a, a minimal, a min, sort of a mini lack of coordination on the economic front. Wonderful. And I'm, I'm very cognizant of the time. So I'll ask you to keep your response to me in this economic question very uh, tight, uh, Dr. Chilla, which is um, the resources sector, the extractives industry, particularly copper, is a mainstay uh, in Zambia's economy. What, what are the kind of policy interventions or support that you are looking uh, for the sector uh, under this administration. Um, there have been tense relations uh, between uh, some of the uh, extractive industry players and the government in the past. Um, walk us through that. W what are you looking for? What can we anticipate? Uh, thanks, Chris. Again, the question is, I don't know. What can we anticipate? I don't know, because we have not seen a comprehensive plan coming out from the government about what to do with the mines, right? especially two mines that we took over uh, in the PF administration, Konkola Copper Mines and Mopani Copper Mines. We took those mines over, but it's not very clear what we're going to do with them. And this is a bit worrying, right, uh, for some of the reasons that you raise. Uh, sure. Certainly, I'm hoping that, uh, and I'll be very quick, but I'm hoping that uh, mining policy is much more stable in this regime than before. I'm hoping that as a country, we can get much more revenue from the mines than we did before. As you know, yesterday, the price hit 11,000 metric tons. I think this is a historic high, right? And it will be heartbreaking. It will break my heart, Chris, that if we, the Zambian people, do not enjoy in this bounty that God gave us. And I'm worried, again, I, I keep sounding like the, one, the person who's just talking about worry, but I'm worried when I look at the fiscal stance that the Minister of Finance announced in the budget towards the mines. Corporate income tax has come down. Mineral royalty tax is tax deductible, right? So all these things are pointing to the direction that suggests that maybe the Zambian people might not enjoy this bounty again. The arguments are if we reduce these taxes, we will encourage investment to come in. But you know, there's a whole long literature on whether tax incentives actually result in if foreign direct investment coming in. And if actually that FDI does create jobs, I worry again about these kinds of things. So that's out, 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 my, out frame my response as a worry, uh, given what I've already seen from the new Dawn government, so far as mining is concerned. Brilliant, uh, Dr. Chela, very, very clear and, and, and concise. Um, because we're running out of time, I'm going to ask uh, the three uh, participants that we have today on our webinar to give their final observations and maybe to limit uh, your concluding remarks to about five minutes each, and that should bring us uh, close to the end of the time that we've dedicated to uh, this webinar. And maybe I can ask uh, uh, Miss Miti to give her initial uh, closing remarks, and then we can hand over uh, to Boniface. Um, I think what I would say, uh, in closing, is that... Um, President Hitchlema inherits uh, or, or comes into office at one of the most difficult times possible in the history of Zambia. I think it is, it is mostly agreed that we were heading over the abyss uh, with, with the PF. So the number of things needed to fix are many. One. Secondly, you have a, a population that has been bitten too many times and is impatient. You know, it's not willing to give, uh, uh, I think, the, 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 the president or the ruling party too much space. I think that it's, it's, it's almost fearful uh, about what is, uh, what is possible, which is, I suppose is a good thing because this government is going to be held uh, to account. But overall, I think sitting in, 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 in my corner, forget, forget the questions of the economy, sitting where we sit, I think that one of the 
biggest problems we had as a country, which was essentially the country becoming an extremely unhappy space, an extremely lawless country, which was, was unrecognizable even I think from our neighbors, you know, it took a long time for our neighbors to believe how bad things were in Zambia because that was just not our reputation. I think it, on that trajectory, I think we are doing very well. I also think that if you're an ordinary Zambian, you know, like just an ordinary person on the street, your life is that much easier because you don't have cadres sitting on your case. Going forward, that will not be enough. I think we're going to need concretization of our democracy, which is why we need laws to change. We, we need to ensure that, I think President Hichlema should ask himself if indeed his pronouncements are true. He should ask himself whether if he left after five years, the the, the 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 legislative and constitutional environment would not allow for another dictator. That is what he needs to do to ensure that in this period the changes are such that they can last beyond whoever comes into office. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Uh, that's uh, Ms. Laura Mitty, who is, is the executive director of the ACA, uh, who's joining us today. Really, thank you so much, Laura, for your keen uh, observations. Maybe we can hand over to my brother Boniface for your concluding remarks. Thank you so very much, Ms. Arol, uh, Maroleng. Um, I think it is very important uh, for President Hijilema uh, and the new Don government for the next 100 days to quickly settle down and ensure that they finalize the appointments for key uh, positions in government so that by so doing, they now focus on implementing even some of the good pronouncements that we've already spoken about about uh, during uh, this uh, particular discussion in as far as free education is concerned, uh, legal and law reform is concerned, uh, implementing the decentralization policy and other good things that need to be uh, done. So implementation will be key. Uh, and that is what the people of Zambia want. They would want to see President Higilema succeed uh, and the UPND succeed. And that can only be done if they deliver uh, on their key uh, promises. And again, as a peace builder, uh, I want to say that uh, for the next 100 days and indeed for the next uh, five years, uh, it is paramount uh, that uh, President Higilema continues to focus on healing the nation. Uh, continue to focus on ensuring that there is inclusiveness and that nobody feels marginalized or excluded uh, from being a citizen of the Republic of Zambia or indeed from participating in the democracy and governance process uh, of their country. This is incredibly important. Related to that, uh, uh, we want to appeal uh, and uh, uh, to President Hichilema and the New Dawn government that uh, uh, losing an election is not easy. Uh, and indeed, for those or uh, some people who lost uh, the election within the opposition uh, PF uh, right now, they are still in disbelief, they are still in shock. Uh, it is important that they embrace everybody as they seek to unite the nation, build a stronger, uh, stronger polity uh, that will be focused on a developmental agenda. And ultimately, our, our last point is that uh, a development must be key. Uh, the completion of some of the key economic roads in the country, such as the Great North Road, as you go into Muchinga or northern provinces, uh, is uh, paramount. Uh, so that all Zambians uh, begin to feel the weight uh, of uh, the new dawn and begin to partake in the national cake where development is concerned. So that is our appeal. Make sure that no Zambian feels left behind and that going forward, uh, we have nothing but prosperity. And in so doing, ensuring that uh, the remaining farmers who need to be paid by the Food Reserve Agency are paid very quickly as a way of ensuring that uh, uh, issues of food, sec uh, food uh, security are not affected in the coming forthcoming farming season uh, going uh, into the future. Thank you so very much uh, to Good Governance Africa and the Million Guardian for this opportunity. No, indeed. Thank you, Mr. Boniface uh, Chimbe, Executive Director of the Southern African Center for the Constructive Resolution of uh, Disputes, SACORD, based in Zambia. It's been really great to hear from you. And uh, really taking us home is uh, my brother, Dr. Grieve uh, Chilo. Over to you, sir. Uh, thanks, Chris. Uh, again, thank you so much for putting this event together. I think this is the first event, curiously, 
uh, organized by our brothers and sisters in South Africa that sort of commemorating the first 100 days of this historic presidency. I, I just want to reiterate what my colleague said. I think we shouldn't underestimate what happened on August 12th, right? We were able to slide back from a very dark place. We rescued the country and uh, we are marching forward. Uh, as it And we have entrenched within our people the idea of democracy and what democracy means. I, I was celebrating with everybody else the morning the, the chairperson of the Electoral Commission announced Hakainde as uh, as the as the president elect and everybody from all walks of life that morning said power belongs to the people so i think that idea was reiterated on august 12 and uh, i'm very happy to hear that i'm also happy you know the man that the president is i mean when he gives his speeches I always measured you know they don't inspire hate you know they, they're not retributive uh, and one certainly appreciates that uh, for the first time as an economist I can disagree with the with some of the economic management managers on 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 economic policy principles. Not that I don't know, right? In the previous regime, I didn't know what the date was. I didn't know what their policy was, and this was very difficult for me to engage with them. But now it's very clear. They're very transparent. They've told us basically where they stand on economic policy vis-a-vis -vis certain things. So I agree. At least I can debate with them on matters of principle or uh, policy. I disagree certain with the policies, and I think the one thing that I would want to encourage the new Dawn administration to do is to widen the space of, uh, of you know, the space of economic policy consult consultations, I think. Uh, I think it is economic policies being forged by a very narrow constituents, right, mostly the Ministry of Finance, the Central Bank, you know, the IMF, but I would really appreciate if this scope of people who are consulted was wider. Right. Let us develop an economic policy plan that is popular, that is widely accepted, as opposed to one that is crafted by technocrats alone. Because the problem of economic recovery is not a technocratic problem alone. It's a problem for all Zambians. And I think it's important that we carry every Zambian along as we forge economic recovery plans. So I would like the president to consult widely the unions, the students, the marketeers, the youth, you know, everybody really who has a stake in this country that we call Zambia. Uh, thanks, Chris, for this opportunity. It was very nice. And I, I'm looking forward to more of these kinds of engagements. Thank you so much. That was uh, Dr. Grief uh, Chelwa, who is Director for Research at the Institute on Race, Power and Political Economy at the New School. It's uh, really been fantastic having this uh, wide ranging and really open uh, conversation about the past 100 days of President uh, Hichilema's administration. Certainly one of the key things that we'll be looking out for is whether the promises uh, that were made uh, in the run-up to the elections that saw President Hichilema coming into office shall be fulfilled. Those promises of inclusion, promises of peace building, promises of unity, economic development, and certainly promises of greater social cohesion will ultimately be made in the we hope very successful a term of office that will be enjoyed by President Hichilema. I think what is quite apparent is that President Hichilema came into office with the trust, the hopes, and indeed the future uh, aspirations of the Zambian uh, electorate uh, behind him and backing him. Let's hope focusing on Zambia will result in the fulfillment of these hopes and aspirations of the people of Zambia. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been great having you here. And uh, for all of those who have been joining us online, we hope that you have found the interventions to be hopeful. And we look forward to having you again in our next installation of webinars jointly held by the Mail and Guardian and Good Governance Africa. From Johannesburg, South Africa, it's uh, goodbye. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you so much, Chris.